Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Welcome everyone. Welcome. Lovely to see you. I can see that we've got 12 people um, have joined us or 12 people have logged in. So I don't know how many people that is actually, but we'll come to that in a minute. I'd like to begin our second live Words with Wine online. My name is Tamara and I'm the Library Events Officer for the South Perth Libraries. And it is my great joy to put these things together along with our team here. And tonight we've got a very special guest. But before we start, um, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land that we are meeting on, the Wajak people. And I'd like to acknowledge and respect their continuing culture and the contribution that they make to the life of this city and region. The City of South Perth Libraries were, we believe, the very first libraries in Perth to have an online author talk. And Emily Paul was with us a couple of weeks ago and she spoke about her debut novel and writing short stories. At that time, 31 logins joined us. And if you missed it, you can go to the City of South Perth uh, YouTube channel and you can watch it there at your leisure. I've now got a couple of small uh, tech sort of housekeeping things that I'd like to run through with you. For those of you who've not used Teams before, um, don't worry, nobody can see you. OK, so if you're on the couch with your jarnies and your Ugg boots, that's absolutely fine. None of us can see you. Um, and, and except you can see us. So as you can see, I'm sitting here in one of the city's meeting rooms, which has been set up to facilitate um, online uh, events like this. On the right hand side of your screen, you should see the live Q&A uh, column open. And when that in underneath that that it will give you an opportunity to ask questions and I'd like to invite you to ask your questions as we go so that we can start to build up a little um, little list of questions for Isabel to answer towards the end of tonight's event. Um, we'd also recommend that you put into that when you're prompted use your given name and your last initial just so that we can differentiate if we've got a couple of joes or you know we can differentiate who's asked which question and um i think now is about the time where if you're settled on your couch and you've got your wine and i hope you've got your cheese because we've got ours here about time for me to pour a glass of wine and, and perhaps um, offer one to, to Isabel. Isabel, would you like a glass of white? I'd love. You'd, you'd love a glass of white? That would be that would be mm -hmm. terrific. There you go. Thank you. You're welcome. Very nice. So, cheers, cheers, Isabel. I'll um, I'll just give a brief introduction to you. Um, Isabel Carmody is one of Australia's most highly acclaimed authors. At fourteen, she began writing what has become a, a bit of an Australian classic, I think, Over Newton. It was the first book of her much-loved Over Newton Chronicles. And she has since written many works in the fantasy genre. Her novel, The Gathering, was a joint winner of the 1993 Children's Literature Peace Prize and the 1994 Children's Book um, Association um, Book of the Year Award. And Greylands was a joint winner of the 1997 Aurelius Award for Excellence in Speculative Fiction. Isabel was also named White Raven for the, at the 1998 Bologna Children's Book Fair. Her work for young readers includes two series, The Legend of Little Fur, which is just the most 
I don't know if you've got, if anyone's got the edition, this edition, it's the cover is incredibly tactile. It's beautiful. It's like fur. It's really a, a, it's a very precious book. If you've got this series, um, then I would hold on to them because I think they're, they're very, very precious. But the, the book, the other series is this one. And tonight, Isabel's going to talk a little bit about the last book that she wrote for that series. And that's The Kingdom of the Lost. The first book of that, of that series, The Red Wind, again, won the CBCA Award for Book of the Year for Young Readers, but in 2011. Now, Isabella is not only a writer, she's also an illustrator of her own books and of some picture books, as well as collections of short stories for children, young adults and adults. So she's a very talented lady. After living in Europe for more than a decade, um, Isabel now divides her time between Brisbane and uh, her home on the Great Ocean Road in Victoria. Just sounds divine, lucky lady. Um, and she's currently been working on a PhD at the University of Queensland. She lives with her partner and her daughter and Minta, a shadow black cat. So without any further ado, I would like to hand over uh, to Isabel and um, take it away. Hello, it's very nice to be here. Um, I'd like to also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land I'm standing on right now, which is the Gubby Gubby people. And I would like to acknowledge and respect their consistency of culture and their contribution to the lives of this region too. Um, I suppose uh, I should toast all of us getting here at this time of night. It's actually a bit later over this side of the world, over this side of the country. Um, I'd like to begin um, by showing you um, a list of books because it did occur to me when I was thinking about what I might say tonight that there were lots and lots of books in which libraries or librarians or um, books, but particularly libraries and librarians occur. So I've, I've made this list and I thought it would be really nice if tonight when we get to the, you've got the place where you can write the Q&A questions down, it would be really nice if you can think of any books yourself that we might include on this list. And the reason I thought this list was lovely was because we, we libraries are just such an, they have such a, they play such an important role um, in our lives, uh, certainly in my life, but in, in a funny sort of way, the fact that writers write books in which they make libraries or librarians important it's just it just it's like it squares their importance for us and so I, I just picked some of the ones that I've liked very much um, on the list we have um, Umberto Eco's Name of the Rose of course a medieval um, detective story um, fabulous fabulous book Shadow of the Wind um, that that's a really beautiful book too um, Carla I can't read the edge of my own writing so I'm not going to cuddle us and you will have to look up the rest on the list. We're going to have this list for you at the end. Um, the Little Paris Bookshop by Nina George. That's translated from French. Body in the Library. We can't go without a book from Agatha Christie. Um, Perfect Place for a Murder on top of everything else. The Book Thief, of course, Marcus Suzak's beautiful book. Um, the Uncommon Reader by Alan Bennett, who wrote some extremely fine short stories. The Historian by Elizabeth Kostova. The Strange Library by Haruki Murakami. I particularly love his writing. And this is just a beautiful little hardcover book, which is um, more, well, it looks like a children's book, but it's a lovely little philosophical book. Um, the Railwayman's Wife by Ashley Hay. Um, the Silver Bow by Lisa Tuttle. The Librarian of Buzzro by Jeanette Winter. And that really beautiful, well, I saw it as a film first, but 84 Charing Cross Road by Helene Hanf. Um, it's a beautiful book too. Um, the Night Book Mobile, and which is uh, a graphic novel by Audrey Niffenegger, and uh, in particular, um, The Time Traveller's Wife, where the main character is um, a librarian. The Never Ending Story by Michael End. Un-London by China Mieville, who's 
I think his writing is so brilliant, I can barely hang on by the fingernails of my mind to what he's trying to say. Um, the Library of Bagel by Borges, um, The Borrower by Rebecca um, Mackay, Something Wicked This Way Comes, and Fahrenheit 451 by Ray Bradshaw, Strange and Mr Norrell by Susanna Clarke, and Name of the Wind by Patrick Rothfuss, which is also an exquisite audiobook. And many of those are also available as audiobooks if you happen to like those. You can also get those from libraries too. So um, it's just, um, it seems like a good way to begin by talking about the way writers tend to take books into their, into their um, libraries rather, into their books. And The Gathering, which is the book that Tamara mentioned, won Book of the Year for you, the first time I won Book of the Year was with that book. And in it, I, I definitely pay homage to every library that ever gave me refuge as a child. And librarian libraries um, contain these wonderful people called librarians. And I always had a particular fondness for librarians because when I was young, one of the safe places in a school was a library. And uh, teachers would tend to send you out to get a breath of fresh air, which meant in some schools, in some cases, you were endangering your life when you went out into the playground. And uh, then there was this beautiful moment when the library opened and you could go to the library and there would be these lovely people called librarians who knew what you liked. If you were a bookie kid like I was, they knew what you liked and they were adults who didn't adult you. They didn't lessen you. What they did was talk books with you. They talked about what they loved most and and you would share this love and that an age disappeared. I think that was one of those, for me, first experiences where age wasn't was a consideration when you talked to a librarian. What was a consideration was this lovely crossover of books and and where you would share that common interest. And I know now, of course, librarians love kids like me. They love kids who like books. And it was just a meeting of minds. It was a safe place. And of course, librarians are all those things. They're places where you can go to be warm. They're places where you can go to learn things, where you can go to find information that you need. Um, and you can often meet other people like you. If you're bookie kids, you're not necessarily a kid who finds it easy um, to interact with other people. Um, it's easy for me now as an adult. I've learned how to interact very um, well. But when I was a kid, I certainly didn't. All I wanted to do was get into the library and inside a book. And for me, the important thing about a library was that it was access to everywhere and everything. When I grew up, we didn't have a car for most of my childhood. We didn't go anywhere very much or do anything very much. We didn't have a television. So we didn't have radio with news streaming into the house. We didn't have all of that other information. We had um, we had library and that's what that my access to the world was through the library. Um, so, that, so that was perhaps the most important thing for me. Um, but libraries in a community, they're also a hub for the community. I mean, it's interesting in this time when we're, we've all shut down and we're, we're locked down. For me, one of the laments is not being able to go to the library. I was just speaking to an older couple the other day who was saying how much they passionately miss the library. And I, who am doing a PhD, had the most awful moment when I had all of my books. I returned them faithfully, thinking, well, I can bear to let go of them because I know I can have access to them and then the library doors closed and I couldn't check any of my facts. I couldn't check any of my citations. And it really felt like something, one of perhaps the most important things that was closed down was access to that for me. I don't know how kids like me managed during this time. I guess they had books at home. We had, we didn't really have very many books. My parents didn't buy books. We did have two sets of encyclopedias because in those days, um, when I was young and growing up, they had a man in a bad suit would come to the door and knock and try and sell your parents a set of encyclopedias based on the fact, and he, he would give this little speech and his speech would basically be, your child will fail at life unless you buy these. And my parents must have been very much guilted by this because they bought two sets of encyclopedias. And there was a lot of stuff about those encyclopedias that I didn't really understand because if you don't have television and you don't have adults coming and visit, visiting you and you don't interact much with the world, we had a very hermetically sealed childhood. 
one of the ways you can have access is through books. And so we had these encyclopedias, but they referenced so many things that I didn't understand. Now, in a library, you can ask a librarian, I don't understand, or what is this? You've got some direction. But when you've got your own two sets of encyclopedias at home, you blunder around, like in the dark, putting your hands on books. And the only two parts of the books that I passionately loved was in one set of encyclopedias, there was, there was, um, there was a couple of books on myths and legends. And I didn't actually realise when I was a kid that anything that was in an encyclopedia, I thought must be true. So when there were Cyclops and Pegasus, I thought we'd, we'd done something terrible and we'd managed to lose them. And, and somehow we lost them and they weren't in the world anymore, but they had once been. So I really loved those things that I didn't see in the world, but I imagined were there once. I thought they were real. And the other thing that I loved, I was just talking about this earlier tonight, in the other set of encyclopedias was this, this particular section, which was leaves of cellophane paper with a dissected frog on them. Now, why that should be so enchanting to me, I don't know. But it was that information that you can only get in books. And each, each leaf you turned would be this new sliver of the innards of a frog. Sometimes I think the whole reason I'm a writer is, or, is in order to, to find out what's inside people or inside things, why they work, why they do the things that they do. And books gave me access to that. So in a way, we did have access to books at home, but we didn't have any guidance and we were just left to, to deal with them. And I, I must say, sometimes today I feel that um, in, in with the internet, with this massive information available, you could say, well, all information ever is available in the internet. But I don't think it is. There's so much information that we just simply don't know how to negotiate it. And again, a library organises information for you. So what's in a library has been curated by somebody, has been someone has decided those books were worthy. Someone's read those books, someone's researched those books, and there they are. And books that are in the library are in general, if they say fact or if they say if they present themselves as fact, they are fact. And I think we live in a world where sometimes it's quite difficult to know what facts are. So that's another place that you, a library is another place you can go um, to find out what's real and what isn't. I mean, for me, what isn't real is very important, but I do want there to be a division somewhere that someone's going to say, this is real and this is not real. Um, and the other thing about libraries, of course, is you can roam and you can roam through the levels of a library um, into, I mean, we had these wonderful librarians because for some reason, perhaps they still have it this way. I mean, Tamara, you'll let me know that in, when I was growing up as a kid, um, you weren't allowed access to certain books in the library. Um, but my librarian let me go anywhere I want and do anything I want. You know, I must have had the hundreds of teachers in my life, but I remember the name of my first two librarians, Mrs. Green, and Mr. Muller. It was this little dapper man with a tiny little beard. And Mrs. Green had a big fluff of white hair like a meringue. And they were both wonderful. He had a very strong German accent, but they were wonderful people. Both of them in their own ways were gentle guides and just people who would tell you the truth about things. People who would say, I don't think you'll like that book. Or why don't you try this one? You'll love this one. Maybe that's one of the most beautiful things about a library is a librarian can share a love of books with you and it can extend you in the direction that you want to go. Um, I went to libraries. My, the first library that was ever important to me was the one that I attended that was in my own neighbourhood so that we could walk to it so I could go on my own. That was very important to me. The fact the only trip I made as a kid on my own was to the school or to the to the school library and or to the library, which was separate from the school. And the school was a place you had to go to, but the library was a grown up place that you could go to and that the librarians there and the other people there, you had exactly the same level of respect as a reader as anybody else. Again, there was that sense of age and all sorts of barriers dissolved when you went through those doors. For me, it's like going to the opera now. One of the things I love most about going to the opera is, and this is going to sound mad, but going to the opera, no one is going to punch you at the opera. You know that that's a place where civilised people go. And so somehow I feel like when I go into a library, people are largely civilised in there. So it seems like a come a zombie apocalypse, 
the place I'm going to is I'm going to barricade myself into a library. I think that would be a good place to go. So um, that was the first most important library to me. And then when I went to school, and I was at school, I was at a really, really tough school in a housing commission area, and that was the only safe place um, in the school. So I spent a lot of my time in the library. And there's not much you can do in a library if you don't have any friends, but read. And you know, I think any of you could name book friends, people you met through books, someone inside a book that was one of your kindred spirits. And as a kid, they were the friends that I found. And some of those friends were much older people and some of them were much younger people. Um, or sometimes they were not human, but they were kindred spirits. And I learned how to think by reading books. And so gradually in my school years, I would say my evolution, I mean, it would be nice to say, I can remember teachers that had a really strong influence on me, but I can't. For me, it wasn't like that. It wasn't that teachers were bad. It's just that they didn't impinge on me in the way that librarians did, um, because it was in the library that I wrote. I, I began to write my story. I mean, I was writing at home, but I was also writing in these lovely little, like at my library, my high school library had, I, I um, had a little cubicles and some of them faced onto a little garden no one could get into. It was like a glassed in garden and it was this sort of magic, it was like Mary's secret garden. And you would sit and you would look into this place and you would, I would type my stories. So for me, it was a place where my imagination could also, it was quiet. It was, people weren't yelling at one another or screaming at one another. There wasn't loud music, there wasn't advertisements. That quiet that a library can offer you is as, I don't know, I think it's as spiritually deep as a church, perhaps even better because there's more books available in a library. Um, I'd like to talk though now about some of the significant libraries um, that came to me when I was older or that I visited when I was older. So leaving school, I went uh, on and I became a journalist. Um, I started out a terrible, terrible job was my first job. Like any student coming out of um, um, university, I was looking for a job and I applied for literally everything, even things that were just completely unlikely. And I just thought, well, I'll just apply for everything I can think of, anything that looks even vaguely likely. And I finally got an interview yeah. with the, 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 I think it was something called the, the State Rivers and Water Supply Commission. It was the dullest thing in the universe. And I was going to be a publicity person for this, for the basically sewerage and drainage and things like that. So I went along and I had an office in the basement. And it was kind of the library of the place. And I had to, the, my first job, and I'm the, of all the people in the universe that would not be the person who you would give this job to, I am the one. I had to create a bibliography. When they told me I was gonna create a bibliography, I didn't even know what one was, but I knew that that was my job. I wanted to keep my first job. So I had to figure out what one. So I had to somehow produce a, a, a book which would document all of their their stuff in their library, which was about drains and dams and engineering. It was the most tedious, dreadful job. I was in that job for a year. I did that terrible job. I was in a library. I got pneumonia twice in that year. I think it was psychosomatic so that I could go home and lay in bed for a while. And when I was home in bed one day and I was getting better and I had a weekend off, I thought, I cannot do this anymore. I can't do this. So I thought, I'll just, I'll ring the local newspaper office. And I called the the uh, editor the, and I, the, the office and I said, who do I speak to if I want to get a job? And uh, they told me the chief of staff. So I, I said, well, what's the chief of staff's na name? And they gave me the chief of staff's name. And I was, remember I was desperate. So I called the chief of staff but, and I asked for him by name. And then I said, his name was Gary something. And I said, Gary, I think you should give me a job. That was my introductory statement to him. And later on, I said to him, I was truly desperate. And he said to me, well, we don't have any jobs at the moment. And I said, well, I think you should put me on a list for a job. And he said, well, what, what kind of job do you want? And I said, well, I want to be a journalist. And I think I'd be a good journalist. And he said, I said, could I have an interview? And he said, well, if you can be here within 15 minutes. I was dressed with a folio at his office in 15 minutes. And uh, I went and I gave him this 
big pile of stuff that I'd done in my life and he flipped through it. He knew I'd been to university and he said, we don't have a job for you. And I went home and thought, well, well what did I have to lose? And one week later, he called me and offered me a job. So I moved from the bibliography of hell, from the library of hell into um, journalism. And once again, I had access to archives and libraries that were in the bottom of the newspaper office. And they were fascinating because there was a library of, of newspapers, of old, old newspapers. Nobody went there anymore because they were moving it all on. They had a microfish. Do you remember what, man, Tamara, do you remember what a microfish was? Back in that day, you had to find a kind of like a, yeah, you do. You had to find a, you had you used to have a gigantic black sheet, which was like a negative, and you had to push it all around and try and read it somehow and find the thing you wanted. So they had those, and they were translating every all these old newspapers into these microfishes, which were the, the pinnacle of technological achievement in that moment. So I used to go and look through these old newspapers. I just found them, whenever I was doing a story, I would go down and I would look in that basement and I was often found down there crawling through some story I'd found. And later on, when I um, wrote The Gathering, um, I'd used, I, I had, I put a journalist into the story. He was one of the important characters, one of the characters I really liked and not a main character. And he was down in that library and Nathaniel, and Nissa in that book, Nathaniel goes down to that library to try and find the information about the past he needs. So libraries are not just about um, just about fiction, of course, they're about ways of looking at the world and ways of researching the world. Um, later on in life, in more recent years, in those 10 years in particular that I lived in Europe, um, I, I had access to some really beautiful libraries. And we're actually going to show you some of the, the libraries now that um, one in particular, Strahov Library, um, is one of the most beautiful libraries in the world. You can just see it in this picture in the background. That's Pla Prague Castle there. But to the left of the Prague Castle, you can see these two little steeples going up. That's the that's the that's the monastery um, where Strahov is and uh, um, the castle itself, of course, has its libraries. And what you see around the outside is actually the castle. And that inside is St Vitus Cathedral, which is extraordinarily beautiful. And this is Strahov. And uh, you can see this grassy hill across the front there. I many, many times walked from the left, from the, your left, across the hill, um, Petrin Hill, um, to Strahov and uh, down into the old town. And on the right, running right down from from um, Strahov, uh, you have King's Row, which is where the king used to catch his, um, his uh, take his entourage up this narrow um, hill. Um, so that I'm on the same screen, aren't I, Tamara? Yes, I am, we're nodding. And this is the front of, um, yes, I see. <laughs> I have many pictures of, um, um, yes, yeah, so this is the front. This is the front of the lovely building. And I used to pass this just, you know, every other day, just going for a walk. One of the most beautiful things about living in Prague was just these beautiful things I saw. Of course, oh, this is a long time ago now for me, but uh, it was very beautiful. And that's the front entrance there. I think we've got some insight. Look at this. Isn't, aren't these absolutely gorgeous? Absolutely beautiful. And see these glow. I mean, the, the roofs are just exquisite. Sometimes I think how they must have painted those lying on benches so they could reach up to those. But they're just, I mean, the books are wonderful, but the libraries themselves are just exquisite objects of beauty. I mean, like churches, libraries and churches, castles, the, 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 the art they contain or the history they contain is not just in the books, um, in them, the, the buildings themselves are a repository of knowledge and exquisite art. Um, this one's particularly beautiful. You see all the um, globes in this one. Tamara and I were talking about my PhD, which I'll talk about a little bit later on. And uh, I'd mentioned something um, in my in my PhD. I'd mentioned something about, um, or I, I'm not sure how we got onto it, but uh, you, you, you're probably familiar with the the story that at the edges of maps, uh, here be dragons is the words here be dragons, which always uh, um, stand and they put dragons at the edge of the unknown and I, I knew this and I took this into my PhD but my PhD novel but I didn't realize something that Tamara told me and here's where librarians can help you she told me this beautiful fact she told me that there's only, there was only one place 
that famous phrase was written and it was on one of those globes and I thought I got terribly excited because I thought maybe it was one of the ones in Strahov or another one we're library we're going to show you in a minute but no they're in um, the New York Public Library, this tiny little globe with here be dragons, this one thing written on it. So having learned this just the last couple of days, I'm determined to learn the provenance and find out a bit more about this, um, this where this phrase came from, who thought to put it there. And this lovely time in the world when there was, you know, the dividing line between fact and fiction wasn't quite so clear. I carry all that into my PhD too. Now here we are, I think this is the Clementinum we're in now. And uh, to me, when I was a kid, in a lot, no, it's not, this is, no, this is still Strahov. Yeah, I can't, I can't remember this room. Not all the rooms were open at any one time. They only opened some rooms. Yes, this is, isn't this beautiful? This is my favourite room. This is lovely. But I always imagined, uh, yes, the Clementine is the, um, the other really, really beautiful uh, library. Um, the Clementine has an incredibly exquisite um, art collection too. And you can also see musical concerts in it as well. So it's a repository of art. And you can see it's surrounded. And you can also see in the background of this photo where the little circles appeared. Again, courtesy of Tamara, <laughs> because we need librarians to tell us where things are. <laughs> you can see again, you can see the spires of Strahov and you can also see the um, the old town, uh, some of the old town there too. You can actually see the, the, the view, that's the beautiful old town square too. That's the, and you can see how huge the Clementine is too, why it can contain all of those things is because of the way that it is very close to the, the river. And so, you know, I walked around these and sat in, oh, and this is the room, yeah, this is the room with all the globes in it that I thought might contain um, that tiny little globe. But, uh, to, but to walk through these rooms, I mean, to have access to these was just incredible. And, but in a funny sort of way, those libraries I found when I was much older living in um, Europe, um, they somehow belonged in my mind. It wasn't as if I was seeing something that didn't exist. It was as if I was seeing something that was that's, that existed somewhere in the world. And also I must have seen photographs of libraries. And I always dreamed when I was young of having a library, of being a librarian, because I, I had the deluded idea that librarians would have time to read, a lot of time to read. That's all they would do, read and talk to people like me. <laughs> Now I can see Tamara laughing her head off, which every librarian does whenever I tell, <laughs> tell this story to an audience, because of course librarians have to do a lot of work. They have to do their reading at home if they get any chance to do it. And of course they have to read a lot of those books they buy. So, you know, they're, they're, the, they're the people who can tell you where to go if you're looking for a book. Um, what are we gonna do? And, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about a couple of stories, um, Borges um, stories. Uh, the one on the left that you can see in the screen now is the Library of Babel. And I'm actually going to read you a tiny little bit of this story. And um, Borges, I think, is one of the most perfect short story writers ever. And his short stories are often incredible uh, and philosophical thought experiments, I would say. Many of them are really quite small. And the one on the right, um, published in Spanish, and so originally was the Library of Babel, um, this is called uh, the Library of, uh, well, it's called the Book of Sand. In English, it's called the Book of Sand. And just to explain the Book of Sand, um, if you happen to want to look at these, you can get them both um, in the library <laughs> and uh, um, in English. In fact, um, Borges translated them himself with help. And uh, the Book of Sand tells the story of a man um, that a book was bought by uh, a man who was trying to sell it and uh, he wanted to sell um, a Bible. And the man at the door said, look, I've, I've got Bibles already. And uh, the man at the door said, well, what about this arch archaic book that I've got, this arcane special uh, um, book I've got? And he handed it to the man and, the, and he said to the man, find the first page. And the man couldn't. No matter how many times he turned the pages, there would be, we kept trying to get to the front, but there were always more leaves. And every time he turned it, the book got bigger. And the, man, and the man at the door said, turn it over and try to get to the back of the book. And he did the same thing. And it, it's a book that never ends, like sand 
all of the, the knowledge and it continues. And at first, this man does everything to try and keep his precious book safe. And then he begins to realise it's a monstrous thing, a book that never ends, knowledge that never ends. And of course, it's a metaphor for the fact that knowledge can never be completely contained. Um, the other one uh, is uh, um, the, the story that I'm going to read from. Um, I'm just going to read, it's a very, it's a very strange, I'll just read a tiny little bit. You can actually get this on the internet um, if you can't. I'm not sure um, if libraries always carry it, but uh, it's a very strange book. It's called The Library of Babel, and it begins like this. The library, the universe, which others call the library, is composed of an indefinite and infinite and perhaps infinite number of hexagonal galleries with air, vast air shafts between, surrounded by very low railings. From any of the hexagons one can see, interminably, the upper and lower floors. The distribution of the galleries is invariable. 20 shelves, five long shelves per side, cover all the sides except two. Their height, which is the distance from floor to ceiling, scarcely exceeds that of a normal bookcase. One of the three sides leads to a narrow hallway, which opens to another gallery, identical to the first. And the whole story tells of a universe that is nothing but library. It's the most fascinating book. And I mean, if you think about, you know, there's um, this philosophical idea of um, Immanuel Kant's that our mind helps us to structure our experience of reality. And I think that libraries help us to structure our experience of reality too. And I think they're absolutely indispensable for all sorts of reasons. Um, uh, I thought now, I might um, talk a little bit about, uh, perhaps I might tell you a little bit about my PhD at this point because um, libraries have obviously been terribly important to me, not only because as a writer, of course, your, your books go into libraries and it's always an honour um, and somehow a little surprise when I'm crawling through yet another, uh, another library, looking for books and getting lost in books I loved of the past and books I might read to come across one of my own books. Who would ever have imagined that that kid back at 14 trawling the bookshelves and badgering the librarians endlessly would one day have her books in the library? So for me, this is lovely bracketing of my life um, by libraries. But the thing that perhaps um, when I was writing my PhD, my PhD is, uh, I'll give you the horrible title, I'm writing the slipstream the migration of and metamorphosis of uh, um, the fantastic. Um, and, and the reason that I'm writing is to try and look at how the fantastic can talk about reality very deeply. I guess what I'm trying to say, it's not really a competition for me, which is what I thought it was going to be when I started. What I was going to do when I started out with my PhD was prove that one can write just as deeply about the way the world is, organise our our um, um, our experience of reality using the fantastic just as well as um, using realism. I wanted to prove that they were both just genres. But as I as I progressed through my PhD, more and more, I began to realise that I didn't actually think that. I realised that what I was doing constantly was using both realism and the fantastic as modes and um, as tools. To, to write with. and then I was using them both many times interchangeably and that not only that many many writers do and so that, that that ended up being something I was doing and I gave this name to the to this particular technique of uh, fluttering between realism and and the fantastic um, I called it slipstream which is actually a word uh, a phrase coined uh, by a science fiction writer and he meant it as a category but I, I wanted to use it as a tool and uh, part of my research for my PhD was to research uh, my favourite writer, um, perhaps one of my most formative writers is Ursula Le Guin and to do my research I flew across the world to uh, Oregon and I went to the Knight Library which contains a, an incredible archive of Ursula Le Guin's papers, like I think 200 boxes of Ursula Le Guin's papers and some of those are incredibly tough personal letters and all of these kind of things. And then there were all the things you were allowed to read and all the things you were not allowed to read because they were, until she dies, she wasn't allowing anyone to read them. And within four months, of course, of me coming back from doing my research, sadly Ursula Le Guin died. 
And so now I can have access to all of those things. And it was incredibly frustrating sometimes because I was reading about conversation back and forth between her and somebody she was interacting with for years. And then you'd reach the point where they, they had reached the point in their relationship where it started to be personal. And then suddenly you weren't allowed to read anymore. And so for me, going to the night library was very important. And when I wrote my PhD novel, which is called The Theatre of Death, uh, which I have to say I put in the mail two days ago, um, basically or I like, put in the mail, I sent it off in email two days ago. And uh, and for me, that's the end of it. But I, uh, I, I, I took the real world night library and I stuffed it into my book. And all my life long, I've had this tendency to, to take the world and put it into my book um, if I like it or if I'm curious about it or if I want to taste it. I remember when I was a kid, um, if you can remember the Enid Blyton Magic Faraway Tree, um, um, Silky there used to bake these these lollies called, I can't remember them, but something, I can't remember the name of them. She used to bake these lollies and you put them in your mouth and they would explode and they would be sort of like hot honey. At least that's how I imagined them to be. And um, I really wanted those. So when I was writing um, um, the O. Newton series, you, you'll find in one of the books, um, you'll find there is Ghislaine Bakes, these lollies, these small things which the boy in the story absolutely loves. And they are those same things that the fairy gave to the kids in the magic faraway tree. And so taking the night library, I didn't even pretend. I just took the entire night library, put it as a library into a town that I was writing about. So, I mean, my whole book is, it plays around with all, uh, all sorts of different versions of um, the fantastic magical realism, um, magical thinking, uh, dreaming, writing stories, making things up, lying, madness. So all forms of the unreal are contained within the book with about 20 characters. Um, one of them is a detective following a detective story. One of them is a mother trying to find her son. One of them is a sister um, trying to find a job. So all of these various kind of characters intersect. It's a total nightmare of a book in many ways, but it's, it is a braiding of different kinds of the fantastic and hopefully somebody, some good editor will be able to sort that out for me someday. Um, I think we've almost reached a moment now where we should have a little look at my latest book. We can have a quick look at this because we don't want to spend too much time because I want to answer some of your questions. Um, the, the, the last one in, uh, um, the Kingdom of the Lost series is uh, um, the, the, and the Velvet City. And the Velvet City, the title comes from, these are some illustrations. You can see the one on the left is um, Jluti with one of the diggers on uh, the back of, I won't tell you what that is from the story. And, uh, and on the right, um, Billy is traveling, looking for Jluti as he often was in the stories and comes across these these statues, these terrifying statues that he, he doesn't want to know what they are. As you can see, my drawings are actually really, really simple. If you look at the shape of the characters, the way, because I'm not trained as an illustrator, I concentrated on making the characters themselves a very simple, clean shape. And I concentrated on all, all of my energy on the patterning in the background. I'm very proud of that, that picture there on the left. I can't tell you how many machines I looked at and took photos of to come up with that drawing and the various bits and pieces of it. I take it from like about a dozen different pictures. And on the right, um, this is a this is a, a structure which emulates um, uh, which emulates a machine which we see later on in the story. And that took me at least I think a week to do the illustrations because the the um, the technique is so small. But again, it, the detail is where I try and I, tr I find the polish in my pictures. When I teach kids how to draw, that's what I teach them to do. I teach them how to use patterning to make the, the very simple drawings. Like if you look at the, the simple drawings of these creatures over here, um, you can see they're quite, they're, the, the outlines are simple. The outline of um, Jouti is very simple and uh, the outline of the, the cat is fairly simple too. Um, it's just the detail and the shadowing and the, the watercolour, which because these are all pen ink, um, I can use watercolours to, really to evoke um, some mood as well. Uh, there was, I think there was, was there one more set? 
Oh, yeah, one more. Our favourite, my favourite picture in my whole book of this one is this lovely vessel. And um, through the entire series, um, the, the, they've, they've had a piece, Billy and Judy have had a piece of their, the egg, the metal egg they hatched from. And uh, in each book, the metal egg that they use as a vessel, it started out as a carriage you pull along on the ground with wheels and it's grown and been added to and changed. And in this book, it becomes um, a boat at some point. And uh, this, we see here now the, um, the boat. And uh, I remember putting the sails and using very ordinary sails. And then in a library, I was looking through some pictures of old boats and I saw these beautiful outriggers using a lovely shape like this. So I went back and I started over again and I used I used those shapes. So even in that way too, that I was constantly going through libraries, getting ideas um, visually as well. Some of my favorite books, um, I love the um, uh, uh, Torve Janssen uh, um, books, um, the Moomin Troll books. And again, if you look at the Moomin Troll books, she really was an artist. And if you look at her illustrations, you can see that her illustrations are very simple and all of the artwork around is the patterning that goes around. I was very inspired by her and Edward Gorey, who you can also get in libraries as well. And I think at the end, we're going to show the cover of, of I think we're up to there now, are we? Uh, hang on. Ta -da. Ta -da. <laughs> okay, the Velvet City. Now, this, unfortunately, I redrew the cats and Billy and Schluti for this cover, and I sent them, I sent about 10 drawings because I really didn't like this cat. I didn't like this cat because I didn't like uh, the way he's, the golden, the piece of metal looks like a curl, a weird curl, a weird blonde curl. So I said, I hate that, that has to go. And uh, so I sent all of these drawings, but I unfortunately got for Christmas a beautiful set of golden paints of gold. So I slathered gold over everything. I need to discover the process that Penguin uses to do the covers cannot recognize gold. And so they ended up with this, but luckily or unluckily, it's been delayed. And because it's been delayed, it will give me a chance to draw another cat for the cover, which I'm very happy about. But other than that, I really like how, I love how they did the covers. And I love the fact that the last one is green in particular. The Velvet City uh, came from, um, my daughter um, used to say when she was really little, we were driving along the Great Ocean Road and she would say, have we passed the Velvet City yet? And I had no idea what the Velvet City was. And I would say, honey, what's, what's the Velvet City? And she was too little to tell her, so she couldn't explain it. And then, so I, I always had this romantic idea, of what, what does she think the Velvet City is? And then, of course, one day we were driving along the road and she said, there's the Velvet City. And it was a winery. <laughs> and it was a winery with, with um, um, stucco walls that somehow looked all velvety, and it does. It, it had this kind of hacienda look and velvet, <laughs> velvet walls. So that's where the Velvet City came from. Just the idea of a Velvet City was so weird. <laughs> and now we come to questions. I just, we'll have a drink. hello. Oh. Hi, hi everyone. Hello. Let, me just, let me just pop myself over there so we can hang on, do this one and click me over there. Hi, um, Isabel, I've got a couple of questions here for you, but I wanted to just say that the when you sent me those pictures of your, your illustrations, one of the things that really sort of jumped out at me was that they looked like you'd drawn them on velvet. They look with all the detail and the, the contrast. You know when you, you get the nap of the velvet and you get that shiny and dark bit? It looked yeah. to me almost like you'd drawn them on velvet, which was um, quite fitting with the, with the title of the book. Now, I've got four mm. questions that I think will be fabulous to ask you. Um, maybe five. We'll see how we go for time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to those questions and let uh, Isabel answer them for you. So let's start with a, a bit of a whimsical question. You have lots and lots of books and obviously a huge love of books and libraries and all things written and fiction. And um, that's, that's one of the reasons why we chose why we were so keen to have you here to celebrate Library and Information Week with us, because I knew how much you love libraries. It's something that we, we share. But 
um, we've been asked a question. They're not they don't want to know what your favourite book is, but if you could only sh save one book, which one would you save? Oh my God, a terrible, terrible question. <laughs> oh, Me, yes, I think, well, which of your family would you save if they're all drowning? <laughs> I think we'd all just drown together. Oh, my favourite. What would I save? What would I save? Hmm. Well, I, I think I would just. Oh God, I don't know. I have no idea. Can it be a series? Which <laughs> is a very fat series. There are one book to save. I wish I could think of a wise and brilliant book to tell you. Well, let's let's, I um, think I would let's give you a moment to ponder that because I know that will kind of percolate in the back of your mind in a minute. How about a simple question? What are you reading right now? Um, I've been reading. I was just reading a, um, a, ter a terribly, terribly sad book about the Holocaust. I just can't remember the name of it right now. I knew someone would help me out. This is the book I'm reading right now. I'm just not sure I'm going to be able to finish it. It's just, um, it's called Night and it's about the Holocaust and he he, he lived through the Holocaust and uh, um, survived it. He won the Nobel Peace Prize. Um, so yeah, I'm, um, it's just so sad. But the saddest thing of all I think is perhaps is that He's, he's written a new foreword for it after all those years and he's talking about how he thinks people are forgetting, will forget, and in fact he doesn't know why he wrote it. Well, he does say this beautiful thing in there at some point. He says that maybe the reason he wrote was to try and make sense of his survival for himself and maybe that's the reason we really write, um, to try and make some kind of sense for ourselves of of our experiences, like I was saying before, the idea that libraries structure our sense of reality, like we, our minds structure our experience of reality and libraries help us organise it, I think. I mean, you know that the, the beautiful thing about the, the memory cathedral? In my mind, that memory cathedral is always a library, a library where you store all the books of your life. I'm actually a great rereader too. I, I reread a lot of books. I, re, I probably reread um, out of a hundred percent of books I read, sixty percent of books I read in a year are rereading of books. So the idea of chucking books out that I don't like, I can't imagine that I want access to the books that I've loved. So that's the one. Yeah, that's the one I've just been reading. But like I said, I'm I'm not sure I can manage to finish it. It's really, really very sad. The, the your description there of the cathedral of the the mind and the books, you know, as as a library. Springs makes me think of there's an amazing library in Manchester, which is called the Cathedral of Books, and um, yeah. it's, a, it's a converted yeah. and it's just magnificent. And of course, then one springs across from there across to the Bodleian Library, and which was of course made so famous in Harry Potter. Um, but it, it is mm. the most amazingly beautiful and evocative library in terms of like when I think about the the um the library of my mind i like to think about those sort of like the ones we just saw we saw earlier that you showed us from from prague that was amazing so i've got a question from you know, Maddie. you know audrey niffenegger's book that i mentioned before the night library it's it's i i urge you to get a copy of it and have a look at it if you can it's this quirky quirky strange little book as you can imagine from, from audrey niffenegger and it's a story about a woman who go, who has a fight with her boyfriend and goes walking in the streets one night. It's a graphic novel, and she walks in the street one night, and uh, she she comes across a bookmobile with an old man in it, and she gets in the book, and he, she says, "What in the middle of the night? How strange!" And he says, "Come in," and he's drinking his cup of tea, and she goes to the library, and she realizes it's her library. Everything she's ever read is in it, and she gets out, and she wants to come back the next night, but she can't find it for years. 
and she gets, you know, she splits with that boyfriend. She ends up with someone else. She, and she's older and wandering again another night. She finds it again and it's grown and it's the same man sitting there drinking his cup of tea. And she goes through and she loves these books. I just give me goosebumps even thinking about it, how she goes through and she wants more than anything in the world. She goes and she studies to be a librarian. And the next time she finds the library, she says, please, please let me work with you. Train me. And he says, and he gets suddenly really serious and he says, no, I can't let you do that. That would be too terrible. No, you can't do that. You don't know what it costs. And of course, when she dies, you, you, oh, I shouldn't tell you that. I'm not going to tell you anymore now. <laughs> now you have to go read it. It's a beautiful, beautiful book. I'm sorry, just about to tell me the punchline. But the illustrations are gorgeous too. It's really a, quite a moving book. It has an end that you don't expect. And yet one that when you come to it, you realise, of course, that this idea that we are a repository of all the, aren't we, all the books we've ever read? Isn't our mind actually built of all the books we've ever read? And if you think about the people who've studied and studied and studied their lives long, people we would think of as wise, aren't they just libraries stuffed full of books? Aren't they the Clementinum or Strahov Library? And wouldn't it be beautiful if we strove to be those libraries? You know, not just not just a bookmobile, but some incredible, immense library. We should each be a library in the end. <laughs> I would I would love almost to finish right there, Isabel, because that is just such a beautiful recommendation and endorsement of libraries and librarians. You know, my my colleague and I are sitting here, and we're we're both of us are kind of almost wiping tears because we're. <laughs> We're really touched by by how you how you envisage that and how you've brought that to life. And I I remember same as you, um, libraries were a very safe place for me as a young person. And as you say, you know, I knew that the, the code of behaviour meant that that I wasn't going to be yelled at or pushed around or you know physically you know accosted. I could sit quietly. I could disappear into a wonderful world. And, and Maddie has asked a question. You know, she says, how, how does it feel to know that your books are the ones that 14 year olds badger librarians about? You know, that they're going in and saying, have you got Over Newton? I really need to finish it. Where's the Red Queen? I remember as a librarian, I remember, I, I, I know, I remember being asked, but I cannot remember how many times I was asked is the Red Queen in yet? Is the Red Queen here? Is the Red Queen here? So how does it feel to be somebody what? whose books have, have people grown up with? You know, you're the Australian J.K. Rowling. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's a nice thought. Um, I, I, I mean, I was one of those kids. I used to read series and I used to be deathly just waiting for the next one of those books. It really would never in a million years have occurred to me that I would one day be one of those kids, one of those people that people wanted like that. And yet I'm still the person in the library badgering the librarian for the latest book in a series that I like. So in a way, I'm no different than I've ever been. I mean, I, it's, I'm lucky, aren't I? Just really, really lucky that my books ended up being in libraries. And, and it's, it's, to go back to that thing I said before about, you know, sometimes I'm looking at a bookshop and I'm really just looking for a book. And then I come across one of my own books and uh, I think, oh, yes, that's me. Yes, it. And that's nice do, too. Do you do a, a no. new game and, and do, a, do a secret signing? <laughs> but I have friends all of the time say, did you put your book out to the front in bookshops especially? Did you put your book in the front? And I would say, no, because then I would have to push some other author out. No. <laughs> but you know what you said about the code of behaviour? What I think is that librarians should rule the world like it was a library. Wouldn't it be lovely? Wouldn't it be fantastic if the world was a library? I can't argue with you, and I'm not going to. <laughs> but I will get in this. That what was, what was um, I think, the first, th there's two, two questions. So one is a little bit related to what we just spoke about, which was about, so we're obviously going to go a little bit for people, that, for everybody at home, we're going to go a little bit over. Um, we're fine with that if you're fine with that. Not much, but just a little, because I'd like to give Isabel the opportunity to answer these two questions. So the first one 
sort of re relates again to being a young adult. And uh, this person has said uh, that they, do you think that certain books should only be read by certain ages? For example, the whole young adult thing. They said that they first read Over Newton as a teenager and they were very excited to get their hands on the Red Queen in their 40s. So see what I mean? People grew up with your books. Um, and they yeah. had to reread the whole series again to refresh their memories and they enjoyed them just as much 30 years later. But they found that they were definitely being judged by other members of the household who thought that, you know, reading kids books, why were you reading YA? You know, you're a grown up. Well, what the heck are you doing? As a side note, they do say that the, uh, the judgment from the housemates didn't stop them. But, but what are your thoughts about this whole young adult thing? Well, I mean, I, I when I wrote the Over Newton Chronicles, when I began them, I was a young adult. So I was writing what what deeply concerned me. And I think one of the things that you can often feel in um, young adult books that are not very good is there's a definite sense of here I am writing down to you there. And so I it certainly wasn't because I was the age that I was writing about. I was also writing as someone who didn't know they were going to be published. I was writing for myself very passionately about things that really deeply concerned me. Um, I didn't think of myself as writing for children. I wrote it right through high school, right through that university degree, right into that career as a journalist. And I was working on that book the whole time. I was writing newspaper stories in the day and sometimes going home at night, I would feel that what I was doing, writing my fantasy fiction was deeper and more important than the thing that I was doing in the daytime covering what the mayor said. So it, for me, I, I always took what I did and I always take what I do very, very seriously. If, if it's a book with pictures of little elves in it or whatever it is that I'm drawing, I take that no less seriously. And sometimes I read to adult audiences from, say, that one you've got right there in front of you, the, um, um, uh, the a Fox Called Sorrow, because I think anyone reading from A Fox Called Sorrow can't doubt for a second that I was dead serious when I was writing that book and it mattered passionately to me. So I'm never talking down and I don't think of ages when I write. If I'm writing about a character that's 20, I try to write that character as truthfully 20. What I can imagine from my own memory of being 20, what I've absorbed from my daughter or from people around me and what I've read about 20 year olds or read of characters who are 20. So I'm just trying to draw the tr most truthful 20 year old I can. I'm not really thinking of what's out there in the world that I'm drawing, um, that, that I'm writing to. Um, so I'm always writing to myself in a way. So I'm writing to the most, to the deepest parts of myself, which are as stretched as I can make them. So I wouldn't, I would hope, in fact, I was very glad when people at 40 got, and 50 and 60 got the Red Queen and went back and started and found they could keep on going back, that it didn't, it's smaller and some of the aspects are different, but the only difference really is Elspeth is younger and her, her she's too young to have sex. She's too young, in my opinion, back then in the early book. That's not in her mind. It's not what she cares about in that moment. So it's not in the book. And as time progresses forward, she's a very particular sort of person. And her concerns are what follow the, the character through. I mean, if you think about it, you're not bored by your 10 year old child. You're not thinking, well, he's too childish for me to have any interaction with, are you? I mean, if you think about it, an eight year old, a four year old is deeply interesting to an adult. Just because they're four years old doesn't mean to say they're not interesting. So I think again, we have this thing where you have this idea that someone is less sophisticated or less interesting. It's just, we talk about it differently. Like if I write a character that's eight years old, he can, and I want to write about a character who's eight, who's had somebody die or commit suicide. And he thinks about that. His feeling about that is no less deep and passionate than my feeling about an eight year old who dies. My thoughts about it might be different, but his grief is no less than my grief. His sorrow, his anger, his confusion are no less than, no less deep or important or profound than mine. So when I'm writing about a character, taking that character very seriously, you move away from the idea of age as a category um, into just this is this specific character of this particular age who feels these deep important things to him and to me. 
and if you if you can if you have an interest in these subjects then they hopefully will be interesting to you too so the idea of saying you at 14 can't with this you at 12 can that's problematic isn't it because i know of men of 40 who are who is you know who's dumb as posts who don't read anything at all they read nothing you know, I'm sorry, that's a terrible thing to say, but that's the truth of it. Some people don't read anything and they don't care about reading and they don't care about thinking. There are people like that. And then you can meet a 12 year old who is deeply, profoundly interesting. Now, I remember years ago, just this last little story, because I, before we finish, years ago, I met a boy on a beach when I was giving a, a talk to a group of kids, a redheaded boy on a beach who started who wrote a script for me instead of a story and it was very interesting we had a little conversation he was reading the gathering and he said to me i would like to grow up and be a script writer now in that conversation with that boy that conversation there was no age in that conversation we had but you know what 20 years later that man wrote to me bought the rights of the gathering and he is now making a movie of the gathering using that script using this book i find him at 11 on that beach and that conversation I had with him, he is no different than the, the guy I talk to these days. Sometimes age doesn't matter. You know, it, I think with books, with really deep books, it, as long as they have something of interest to say to you, I think that's the thing that's important. And if you're a five-year-old kid and pick up a book about naked ladies running around with naked men, it's not going to be that interesting to you. So you won't read it anymore. I think a lot of censorship is just censorship of taste and interest. You won't go on and read it. So I think like my old Mrs. Green and my love Lisa Moore, the librarians of my childhood who let me go, the reason my books are in libraries now is because they let me run. So that's probably a very good note to end on. Well, I, uh, have you had any thoughts about that last book that you would save? The, the book that, if all else, well, if everything went apart, what would you save? I think that I, at this moment, I would say a collection of essays that I love very much. <laughs> I don't know. There's a book I'm reading that I, I want to finish, <laughs> so there, there could be that. Um, it, but, but there's a book of essays I love very much that um, Ursula Le Guin wrote called um, A Wave in the Mind. Um, that would be one of the books if that was in a house where things were drowning. I mean, I'd be grabbing for everything I could get my hands on book-wise. But uh, maybe, yeah, I think that's that's the book. That's okay. the book that I'd probably grab at okay. this moment. But that's only this second. <laughs> I, I can't say it. So it's, it's that, that terrible dilemma of desert island books, isn't it? But look, um, the, other, the, the last thing I'd like to finish about is talking about your future projects. And when you were telling me that you had finally finished your PhD, and I, I said to you, wow, I know that you've been working on that for such a long time. I, I imagine that that has taken up so much of your mind space. How does it feel to have all of that mind space now available for something new. So what's on the, what's what's coming up? What are you planning to work on next? I think if you go back to my image of each person at the library we're building for our whole lives long, it's that some huge wing of my life has been full for years of people hammering and banging the way reparations go on for an ever. And I think that, that all those people have finally left and here is an empty room with shelves, and now I can do what I like. So I have, I've got a short story I have to write for a collection, and uh, and that's sort of the thing that I'm going to write immediately. I've got a, a giant book sitting with Alan and Unwin called Come the Night, which I'll be working on. That'll be the next big project. Um, I've got my PhD novel, The Theatre of Death, which I've when I sent it to my supervisor, I sent it also to a publisher very same night. So that's out there in the world seeing if uh, it's a very strange book. So I don't know, maybe it'll end up being one of those books that you can only have as a PhD book, in which case you'll be able to get it online <laughs> or in a library somewhere. I, I mean, there are libraries in um, one of the things as a student I loved with the libraries where you can find people's old PhD theses. Do you know the weirdest thing was finding how many Theses had been theses had been written about me. Who knew? Who knew that anyone wrote theses about these things? Master of Arts theses. Yeah, that was really 
That was very surprising. I didn't expect that. So they will at least, the people who might do thesis on me, thesis on me, they might read my PhD novel. There is hope. <laughs> but other than that, I don't know what I've got. I mean, I've got um, I've got the book of Matthew, which will be um, a standalone um, Over Newton novel, which runs alongside uh, in the in the Over Newton series. Uh, Matthew vanishes out of the series for about four books. And a lot of stuff happens to him and the story of him and Dragon will happen in that book and go beyond um, the Red Queen in a slightly different direction. So I'm really looking forward to that. But I can't do that straight away. And the, um, and the big book that is looming for me is Dark Bane, which is the final one in the Legend Song series. And it's nice that people still ask about that too. <laughs> As I said, there, you will fill that spaciousness very quickly, Isabel. So look, while we've still got you um, there, I just wanted to say a really sincere thank you. Um, and thank you to everyone who's stuck with us. We, we went up to uh, about 16, I think, um, and, and pretty much everybody stuck around right, right to get the full value. So thanks for staying around. And thank you so much, Isabel. I, I just knew that that we would um, have a wonderful um, di uh, dialogue from you around um, libraries and, and all things books and librarian and everything, which was just so appropriate for this week. So thank you so much, soon to be or Are you now officially Dr. Carmody? Oh, no, 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 I can fail. I can still fail. Okay, so well, let's, we let's cross our fingers and let's cross our fingers and say soon to be Dr. Carmody. Thank you so, so much for sharing so much with us. Um, and, and cheers to you. I'll, um, yeah, cheers and, and good luck with everything as it, as it unfolds. And um, good night. Thank you. I'm now going to um, finish with some uh, housekeeping things to say thank you to the, the IT team here at the City of South Perth for their support. Thank you to the team at the libraries. For their support, I've got my colleague sitting just off camera and she might even wave. <laughs> and, um, and the mice have been in yet again to finish the cheese. And um, so so we won't we won't talk about the library mice. Um, if we talk about the library mice, we'll have to close the library again. So we won't mention the library mice. Um, look, at 8.30, um, everyone, you're going to get another email from us. And that email will have a number of things in it. It will have a link to uh, Isabel's personal website, which is if you are a fan of her books, it's an amazing place that you can dive in and, and find out all sorts of things about her writing and all kinds of things about all things Isabel Carmody. Then there's a link to the publisher, to Penguin Random House, who and, and there you can go to buy any of her books. And, um, and follow it when things are launched and so on from her. You can all, there's also a link to the City of South Perth YouTube channel where you will be able to re-watch this if you'd like to share it or if you want to go back and listen again to what Isabel had to say about any of the things that she talked about tonight, you can do that. And I imagine that will be up um, in the next couple of weeks, uh, sorry, a couple of days. So um, just keep an eye on that. And also, of course, if you want to see Emily Paul, if you missed that one and you'd like to, to watch that, you can, you can have a look at that. There will also be that list of books that, Emily, uh, that um, Isabel read at the very beginning when she listed all the books that had librarians or libraries feature in the forefront of the book. So if you're interested in following up on any of those, that list is there. And of course, because we are always wanting to provide you with a new and improved and better service, something that that will meet your um, your needs and your your question, you know, things that you want. We we have a link to a survey. So if you wouldn't mind taking five minutes and just answering our survey, then we can respond to that appropriately. And we really appreciate having that feedback. Um, just quietly, it also helps me deal with my um, statistical analysis for my boss. Um, so I think that brings us to the end of tonight. Um, once again, thank you, big thank you to Isabel and um, to everybody who's been with us tonight. Happy Library and Information Week and we'll see you next time. Good night. <laughs> <laughs>